Chapter 16 Thursday, September 18th I'm at my desk, tying up some loose ends when Ellen runs up to me, holding an email printout. It's from Dick, raising the alarm with all company executives that something has gone terribly wrong with the company invoicing systems. Earlier today, one of the clerks discovered that no customers had been invoiced for three days. Among other things, this means that customers haven't been paying on time, which means the company will have less cash in the bank at the end of the quarter than projected, which will raise all sorts of uncomfortable questions when the company earnings are announced. It's clear from Dick's string of emails that he's livid, and apparently his whole accounts receivable staff and controller have been chain-smoking and doing damage control at all levels. From Dick Landry to Steve Masters, CC Bill Palmer, date September 18th, 3.11 p.m., Priority, highest. Subject, action needed. Potential $50 million cash shortfall due to IT failure. All customer invoices are still stuck or missing in the system. We can't even retrieve them to manually send invoices by email. We're trying to figure out how we can resume normal business operations. There's likely $50 million of receivables stuck in the system, which will be missing from our cash account at end of quarter. Get your IT guys to fix this. The hole this blows in our quarterly numbers will be impossible to hide, and maybe even impossible to explain away. Call me, Steve. I'll be on the window ledge. Dick. We're all gathered in the knock conference room. I'm pleased that when Patty finishes describing the incident, she quickly presented all the relevant changes for the last 72 hours. After she's done, I say firmly to the entire team, First and foremost on my mind is the risk of losing transactions. Ladies and gentlemen, I need to be very clear about this. Do not touch anything without getting approval from me. This is not an outage we're dealing with here. We're in a situation where we could accidentally lose order entry or accounts receivable data. This terrifies me. And that should absolutely terrify you. As Patty said, we need timelines and hypotheses for what might have caused the invoicing system to fail, I say. This is our Apollo 13 moment, and I'm Gene Kranz in Houston Mission Control. I don't want guesswork. I want hypotheses backed up with facts. So get back to your screens, assemble timelines and data, and I want to hear your best thinking on cause and effect. Failure is not an option. By 6 p.m., Patty's team has documented over 20 different potential failure causes that have been proposed. After further investigation, eight remain as likely possibilities. An owner has been assigned to look into each. Realizing that there's little more we can do as a group until they complete their research, we agree to reconvene at 10 p.m. tonight. On the one hand, I'm frustrated that, once again, we've been plunged into a crisis and our day is dominated by unplanned incident work. On the other hand, I feel a deep sense of satisfaction at the orderly nature of our incident investigation and quickly text Paige that I'll be joining the family for dinner shortly. Daddy, I hear as I'm sitting in bed with Grant, trying to put him to sleep while keeping the thoughts of outages out of my head. Why doesn't Thomas the Tank Engine have a tender car? Why? Smiling down at him, I marvel at the questions my three-year-old son comes up with. We're going through our nighttime ritual of reading books. I'm glad to be doing this again, which I do every night. Or did, that is, until the Phoenix recovery effort. Most of the lights are off, but one lamp is still dimly lit. There is a pile of books on Grant's bed, and we're on the third one of the night. I'm starting to get a little dry-mouthed from reading. The idea of taking a little break and doing some research on the Internet on train tender cars sounds pretty appealing. I love how inquisitive my kids are and how much they love books. But there are nights when I'm so exhausted that I've actually fallen asleep during our nightly ritual. My wife will walk in, find me asleep with one of Grant's books lying on top of my face and Grant asleep beside me. Despite how tired I am, I'm grateful to be at home early enough to resume my nighttime ritual with my older son. Yes, we need to find out, Daddy, Grant demands. I smile at him, 
and I dig my phone out from my pocket, intending to do a Google search for tank engine tender car. But first, I quickly scan my phone for any new updates on the customer invoicing problem. I'm amazed at the difference two weeks can make. During the last SEV1 incident that hit our credit card processing systems, the conference call was full of finger-pointing, denials, and, most importantly, wasted time when our customers couldn't give us money. Afterward, we did the first of a series of ongoing blameless post-mortems to figure out what really happened and come up with ideas on how to prevent it from happening again. Better yet, Patty led a series of mock incident calls with all hands on deck to rehearse the new procedures. It was terrific to watch. Even Wes saw the value. I'm pleased to see all the emails indicating a lot of good information and effective discussion among the teams working the problem. They've kept the telephone conference bridge and a chat room open for people working the issue, and I plan on calling in at 10 p.m. to see how it's going. That's 45 minutes from now. Plenty of time to spend with Grant, who should be falling asleep soon. He nudges me, obviously expecting more progress on the research front. Sorry, Granty. Daddy got distracted, I say as I open up the browser. I'm surprised by how many of the search results are all about Thomas the Tank Engine. It's the book series that spawned a multi-billion dollar franchise of toy trains, clothing, videos, and coloring books. With two sons, we seem destined to own two of every item soon. I'm reading a promising Wikipedia entry on trains when my phone starts vibrating and the screen displays Call from Steve Masters. I groan and double-check my watch. It's 9.15 p.m. I've had way too many meetings and phone calls with Steve lately. In my head, I wonder how many of these meetings I can take. On the other hand, after the Phoenix debacle, every outage and incident is trivial in comparison, right? I say gently, Hang on, Grant. Daddy has to take a phone call. I'll be right back. I jump out of his bed and walk into the dark hallway. I'm glad I had just scanned through all the email traffic on the outage just seconds before. I take a deep breath before I hit the button to answer the call. I say, Bill here. Steve's loud voice booms in my ear. Evening, Bill. I'm glad you're there. Of course you know about the customer invoicing problems from Dick. Yes, of course, I reply, surprised at his tone. My team declared a major incident early this afternoon, and we've been working this issue ever since. I've been sending out status reports every hour. Dick and I spent 20 minutes on the phone earlier this evening. I know the problem is serious, and my team is following the process we've created after the payroll failure. I'm completely satisfied that the process is working. Well, I just got off the phone with Dick, and he tells me that you're dragging your feet, says Steve, clearly very angry. Obviously, I'm not calling you at night because I want to chit-chat. Do you understand how intolerable this is? Yet another IT screw-up jeopardizing everything. Cash is the lifeblood of this company, and if we can't invoice customers, we can't get paid. Falling back on old training on handling frustrated people, I calmly reiterate what I already stated. As I said, I talked with Dick earlier today. He's very much impressed upon me all the implications. We've activated our new incident process, and we're methodically looking into what could have caused the failure. They're doing exactly what I want them to, because with so many moving pieces, it's way too easy to make things worse by jumping to conclusions. Are you in the office? Steve demands, cutting me off before I could finish. His question genuinely catches me off guard. Uh-huh. No, I'm at home, I answer. Is he worried that I've delegated the problem away? To reinforce my role in handling the crisis and what my expectations from my team are, I say, I will be calling into the war bridge line at 10 o'clock. As always, we have a duty officer on site, and those on my staff who need to be in the office are there already. Finally, I ask bluntly, Steve, want to tell me what's on your mind? I'm on top of this situation. What do you need that you aren't getting right now? He responds hotly. What I need from you is some sense of urgency. 
Dick and his team are burning the midnight oil trying to figure out how our quarter will end up in six working days. But I think I already know what the answer will be. He continues, We'll probably miss almost every target that we've promised the board. Revenue, cash, receivables, everything. In fact, every measure we've promised the board is going the wrong way. This screw-up may confirm the board's suspicion that we've completely lost control of managing this company. Steve is almost snarling now as he says, So, what I want from you, Bill, is to stay sufficiently on top of things, so that I don't have my CFO saying that you're dragging your feet. The house is burning down, and all I hear from you is about drawing pictures and timelines. What in the hell is wrong with you? You afraid to get people out of bed? I start again. Steve, if I thought it would help, I'd have everyone pull all-nighters in the data center tonight. For Phoenix, some people didn't go home for nearly a week. Trust me, I know the house is on fire. But right now, more than anything, we need situational awareness. Before we send the teams crashing through the front door with fire hoses, we have to have someone at least quickly walk the perimeter of the yard. Otherwise, we'll end up burning down the houses next door. I realize that I've raised my voice in the relative quiet of our house as we're trying to get the kids to sleep. I resume, more quietly. And just in case you forgot, during the payroll outage, we made the outage worse by our own actions. We probably could have completed the payroll run during the business day if someone hadn't started screwing with the SAM. Because of that, we added another six hours to the outage, and we nearly lost payroll data. My hopes that the calm voice of reason is reaching him are dashed when I hear him say, Oh yeah? I don't think your team agrees with you. What was the name of that smart guy who you introduced me to? Bob? No, Brent. I talked with Brent earlier today, and he's very skeptical of your approach. He thinks what you're doing is separating people who actually do the work from what needs to get done. What is Brent doing right now? Shit. I like transparency. I always try to make my team totally accessible to my boss and the business, but there's always risk in doing this. Like having Brent spout off his crazy theories to the CEO. I hope Brent is at home, because that's exactly where he should be, I respond. Until we know for sure exactly what went wrong, that's where I want him. Look, it's rocket scientists like him that often cause the problem in the first place. Every time we escalate to Brent, we perpetuate our reliance on him, and make it that much less likely we can fix things without him. Suspecting that I may be losing Steve, I start again. The chaotic way we currently work, Brent is having to fix the punctured hulls almost every day. I'm pretty sure, though, that Brent is one of the main reasons the hull is punctured in the first place. It's not malicious, of course, but it's just a side effect of the way we work and fix outages here. There is a pause. Then he says slowly and decisively, I'm glad you're being so professorial about this, but we've got a wildfire that's out of control. Up until now, we've done it your way, and now we're going to do it my way. I want you to call Brent in, and I want him to roll up his sleeves and help fix this outage. And not just Brent. I want all eyeballs on screens and all hands on keyboards. I'm Captain Kirk, you're Scotty, and I need warp speed, so get your lazy engineers off their asses. Do you understand me? Steve is yelling so loudly by now that I'm holding the phone away from my ear. Suddenly, I'm furious. Steve is going to screw this up again. Recalling my days in the Marines, I finally say, Permission to speak freely, sir? I hear Steve on the other end of the line snort dismissively in response. Yes, damn it. You think I'm being overly cautious, that I'm hesitating to do what needs to be done. But you are wrong, dead wrong, I say adamantly. If you do what I think you're suggesting, which is basically all hands on deck, I predict that we're going to make things much worse. I continue. I tried to advise you of something very similar before the Phoenix launch. Up until now, we have not been sufficiently disciplined in how we work outages. Given all the complexity and moving pieces, there's too much likelihood of causing another problem. 
I may not know exactly what caused the customer invoicing issue, but I know enough to absolutely conclude that what you're proposing is a very bad idea. I recommend continuing along the lines I am currently prosecuting. I hold my breath, waiting to hear how he reacts. He says slowly, I'm sorry you feel that way, Bill, but the drawer's open on my side of the desk. I'm telling you that it's now DEFCON 1, so go get the smartest people working on this problem, and I want status updates on this IT failure every two hours until it's fixed. Understood. Before I can think about what to say, I find myself saying, I don't know why you need me to do that. You're talking directly to my people, and you're calling all shots on the ground. Do it yourself. I can't be held responsible for the results of this FUBAR situation. And before I hang up on him, I say with finality, and expect my resignation in the morning. I wipe the sweat off my forehead and look up from my phone to see my wife Paige staring at me wide-eyed. Are you insane? You just quit? Just like that? How are we going to pay the bills now? She asks, her voice rising. I turn the ringer off on my phone and put it back in my pocket, saying, Honey, I'm not sure how much of that conversation you heard, but let me explain. Part 2 Chapter 17 Monday, September 22nd in the four days since quitting, Paige has been fretting endlessly. On the other hand, I'm amazed at how much better I'm sleeping at night, as if some huge hidden weight has been lifted from my shoulders. Uninterrupted by emails or emergency pages, the weekend was incredibly peaceful. I was still receiving them on Thursday, but I just deleted the email accounts and blocked the text messages. It felt great. I tell Paige not to take Grant to her mother's. Instead, I'm taking him on an adventure. Paige reacts with a bemused smile and helps me pack his Thomas the Tank Engine backpack. By 8 a.m., we're out of the house and heading happily to the train station, where, for months, I've been promising to take him. For an hour, we watch trains go by, and I'm continually amazed at Grant's unabashed joy. Despite the uncertainty around what I'll be doing next, I feel blessed that I can share this moment with Grant. As I'm taking pictures of Grant screaming with delight and pointing at the diesel trains going by, I realize how few pictures I've taken of either of my kids in the last month. We're still watching the trains when my phone rings. It's Wes. I let it roll to voicemail. He calls several more times, and each time he leaves another voicemail. Then Patty calls, which I let roll to voicemail too. After three more calls, I mutter in exasperation, Come on, guys. Palmer, I answer the phone. Bill, we just heard the news from Steve, I hear Patty say, sounding like she's on speakerphone. With surprising anger in her voice, she continues, I've got Wes here, and we're both completely shocked. We knew something wasn't right when you didn't show up for our regular cab meeting on Friday. I just can't believe you resigned during this outage, and after everything we've achieved. Look, guys, it has nothing to do with you, I explain. Steve and I just had some irreconcilable differences about how to resolve the big invoicing failure. I'm sure you guys will do fine without me. As I say the last part, I feel slightly disingenuous. Well, we've pretty much screwed the pooch since you left, Wes says, sounding genuinely abashed, confirming my worst fears. Steve insisted that we bring in all the engineers, including Brent. He said he wanted a sense of urgency and hands-on keyboards, not people sitting on the bench. Obviously, we didn't do a good enough job coordinating everyone's efforts, and... Wes doesn't finish his sentence. Patty picks up where he left off. We don't know for sure, but at the very least, the inventory management systems are now completely down, too. No one can get inventory levels in the plants or warehouses, and they don't know which raw materials we need to replenish. All the finance guys are about to jump from window ledges 
because they may not be able to close the books for the quarter on time. With all these systems down, no one has the data they need to compute cost of goods sold, gross profit, and net margin. Holy shit. Speechless for a moment, I finally say. That's incredible. Grant grabs at my phone, demanding my attention. I say, Look, guys, I'm with my son, and we're in the middle of something important. I can't talk for very long. But rest assured that I'm really proud of everything that we've done together, and I know that you guys can get through this crisis without me. That's a load of junk, and you know it, Patty says. How can you leave us in the lurch like this? We have so many things that we planned on fixing together, and you're leaving it all completely unfinished. I never figured you as someone who would quit like this. I agree. Leaving now is pretty shitty, if you ask me, Wes says, chiming in. I sigh. I'm never going to tell them about all the frustrating and absurd meetings I've had to put up with with Steve. That's between him and me. I'm sorry to let you down, but it's something that I had to do, I say. You'll do just fine. Just don't let Steve or anyone else micromanage you. No one knows the IT systems like you guys do, so don't let anyone try to call the shots, okay? I hear Wes mutter. Too late for that. By now, Grant is trying to hang up my phone. Guys, I've gotta run. We'll catch up later, okay? Over beers. Yeah, sure, Wes says. Gee, thanks for everything, Patty says. Catch you around. With that, the line disconnects. I let out a long sigh. Then, looking at Grant, I put away my phone and give him my full attention again, intent on recapturing our moment of happiness before it was interrupted. My phone rings again on our drive home. Grant is asleep in the back seat. This time, it's Steve. Having no interest in talking with him just yet, I let it go to voicemail three times. I pull into our garage and get out of the car, trying to get Grant out of his seat without waking him up. As I walk through the house with him, I see Paige. I point to Grant, silently mouthing to her, asleep. I pad softly up the stairs, at last transferring him to his bed and taking off his shoes. With a sigh of relief, I close the door behind me and walk back downstairs. When Paige sees me, she says, That bastard Steve called me this morning. I almost hung up on him, but he gave me a long story about doing all this soul-searching with some guy named Eric. He says he has a proposition for you. I told him I'd pass along the message. When I roll my eyes, she says in a suddenly concerned voice, Look, I know you resigned because you felt it was the right thing to do, but you know as well as I do that there aren't many other companies in town that pay as well as Parts Unlimited, especially after your promotion. I don't want to move away from my family. She looks levelly at me. Honey, I know he's a bastard, but we both still need to earn a living. Promise me that you'll listen to what Steve has to say and keep an open mind, okay? Bill? Okay? I merely nod and step into the dining room, hitting the speed dial for Steve. Steve answers his cell phone on the first ring. Good afternoon, Bill. Thanks for calling me back. I had the pleasure of talking with your wife, telling her all about what a jackass I've been. Yeah, she said something to that effect, I respond. She said that you really wanted to talk. I hear him say, Look. I wanted to apologize for the way I've behaved since you graciously accepted my request to become our VP of IT operations. Dick thought I was crazy when I told him that I was going to have IT report to me, but I told him about how, when I first became a plant manager many decades ago, I worked on the assembly line for a month just to make sure that I understood the ins and outs of daily life of everyone who worked there. I promised Dick that I would get my hands dirty and not just delegate the problem away. I'm angry with myself that I haven't lived up to that promise, and delegating all the IT issues to Sarah was a total screw-up. Listen, I know I haven't been fair to you, 
especially when you've fulfilled your end of the bargain. You've been a straight shooter, and you've genuinely tried to prevent bad things from happening. He pauses for a couple of moments. Look, I just got kicked in the ass by Eric and by the entire audit committee. He held my feet to the fire until I finally understood something. It made me realize that I've been doing something really wrong for many years, and I want to make it right. In short, I'd like you to resume your role as VP of IT operations, effective immediately. I'd like to work with you, as Eric coined it, as the two sides of a dysfunctional marriage. Maybe the two of us together can figure out what is really going wrong with how IT is managed here at Parts Unlimited. I'm convinced that IT is a competency that we need to develop here. All I'm asking is that you spend 90 days with me and give it a try. And if at the end of the 90 days you still want to bail, then you can do so, with a one-year severance package. Remembering my promise to Paige, I choose my words carefully. You've been pretty consistent in being, as you say, a complete jackass for the past month. I've been very consistent in presenting to you my analysis and recommendations over and over again. And each time, you've crapped on it. Why should I trust you now? Forty-five minutes later, after Steve continually tries to woo me back, I hang up the phone and go back into the kitchen where Paige is waiting to hear what happened. Chapter 18 Tuesday, September 23rd The next morning, I'm driving into work at 6.30 a.m. for Steve's IT leadership off-site. He's calling it an off-site, even though the meeting is in Building 2. Earlier this morning, I padded softly into Grant and Parker's rooms to say goodbye. Watching Parker sleep, I kissed him and whispered softly, Sorry that Daddy couldn't take you on an adventure today. It was your turn, but Daddy has to go back to work. This weekend, I promise. This better be worth it, Steve. The meeting is in the corporate boardroom. Walking on to the 15th floor, I still can't believe how different it is than all the other buildings. Chris, Wes, and Patty are already there, all holding coffee cups and plates full of pastries. Patty barely acknowledges my presence. Wes greets me loudly, saying sarcastically, Hey, Bill, nice to see you. I hope you don't quit again today. Thanks, Wes. Chris acknowledges me with an understanding smile, rolling his eyes and making the motions of getting a beer. I nod and smile and turn to the back of the room. My mood brightens when I see the vandal donuts in back, and I start loading up my paper plate. As I'm trying to decide whether having six donuts on my plate is a breach of social protocol, I feel a hand clap me on my shoulder. It's Steve. Good to see you again, Bill. I'm glad you're here. Looking down at my overflowing plate, he laughs loudly. Why not just take the entire platter with you? Good idea. Glad to be here, I reply. Eric takes a seat right across from me, saying, Morning, Bill. Behind him is a large suitcase that he had lugged in. I squint at the suitcase. The last time I saw a suitcase without wheels was in my mother's attic twenty years ago. Eric's hair is dripping wet, soaking the shoulders of his denim shirt. Was he running late this morning and had to run out of his hotel without drying his hair? Or does he look like this every morning? Where exactly did Steve find this guy? Good morning, Steve says, addressing the room. First, I appreciate everyone making it here so early, especially since I know that you and your teams have been working incredibly long hours over the last two weeks. Ha! Eric snorts. That's probably the understatement of the century. Everyone laughs nervously, going to extra lengths to not make eye contact with anyone else. Steve smiles sadly. I know that the last couple of weeks have been harrowing. I now realize just how much responsibility I bear for all of this. Not just for the Phoenix disaster, but everything leading up to the audit issues, the customer invoicing and inventory failures over the last couple of days, and the trouble we're having with the auditors. 
He stops, obviously distraught and needing a moment to compose himself. Is he tearing up? Now here's a side of Steve you don't see every day. What the heck happened to Steve after I left? He puts down an index card that he's been holding, shrugs his shoulders, and gestures to Eric. Eric described the relationship between a CEO and a CIO as a dysfunctional marriage, that both sides feel powerless and held hostage by the other. His fingers worry at the card. There are two things I've learned in the last month. One is that IT matters. IT is not just a department that I can delegate away. IT is smack in the middle of every major company effort we have and is critical to almost every aspect of daily operations. He says, I know that right now nothing, absolutely nothing, is more important to the company's success than how this leadership team performs. The second thing I've learned is that my actions have made almost all of our IT problems worse. I turned down Chris and Bill's requests for more budget, Bill's request for more time to do Phoenix right, and micromanaged things when I wasn't getting the results I wanted. Steve then looks at me. The person I wronged the most was Bill. He told me things that I didn't want to hear, and I shut him down. In hindsight, he was completely right, and I was completely wrong. And for that, Bill, I'm very sorry. I see Wes's jaw drop open. Completely embarrassed, I merely say, All water under the bridge now. Like I said to you yesterday, Steve, apology not expected, but appreciated. Steve nods and looks at his card for several moments. The huge challenges ahead of us will require an outstanding team operating at their absolute best. Yet, we don't completely trust one another. I know that I am partially to blame, but that needs to end now. Over the weekend, I thought back on my career, which as you may know could end at any moment, as my board has made clear. I know that my most rewarding times were always when I was part of a great team. That goes for both my professional and personal life. A great team doesn't mean that they had the smartest people. What made those teams great is that everyone trusted one another. It can be a powerful thing when that magic dynamic exists. Steve continues, One of my favorite books about team dynamics is Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. He writes that in order to have mutual trust, you need to be vulnerable. So, I'm going to tell you a little about myself and what makes me tick. And then I'm going to ask you to do the same. It may make you uncomfortable, but it's part of what I need from you as leaders. If you can't do it for yourself, do it for the livelihood of the nearly 4,000 Parts Unlimited employees and their families. I don't take that responsibility lightly, and you shouldn't either. Oh, shit. That's another part of management offsites I forgot about. Touchy-feely crap. Steve ignores the skyrocketing tension in the room as everyone, like me, puts up their deflector shields. My family was dirt poor, but I'm extremely proud to be the first one to actually make it to college. No one before me made it out of high school. Growing up in rural Texas, my parents worked in a cotton mill. During the summers, my brothers and I were too young to work there, so we'd pick cotton in the fields. People picked cotton in the last century? I quickly do the math in my head, wondering if this was possible. So there I am, on top of the world at the University of Arizona. My parents don't have money to pay tuition, so I find a job at a copper mine. I don't know if OSHA existed back then, but if they visited that mine, they would have shut it down. It was dangerous and filthy. He points at his left ear, saying, I lost most of my hearing in this year when some explosives went off too close to me. I finally get my first big break when I land a job at a pipe manufacturing plant, helping with equipment maintenance. This is the first job where I'm paid to think. I study management, and more than anything, I want to go into sales after college. From what I see at the plant, those sales guys have the best jobs in the world. 
They get paid to wine and dine clients, and they travel from city to city, seeing what all the best factories are doing. Steve shakes his head ruefully. But that's not how it turns out. To help pay for school, I join the ROTC where I get my first glimpse of what kids from middle-class America are like. And it means that after college, instead of going to work in industry, I have to fulfill my obligations to the U.S. Army, which is where I discover my love for logistics. I make sure materials get to where they need to. Soon, I have a reputation of being the go-to guy when you really need just about anything. I'm riveted. Steve's a good storyteller. But it's hard being a poor country hick, surrounded by people from privileged families. I feel like I need to prove myself to everyone. I'm 25 years old, and I still have fellow officers constantly calling me dumb and slow because of my accent and upbringing, he says as his voice cracks slightly. It makes me even more determined to prove myself. After nine years, I'm ready to leave the army after a distinguished career. Right before I'm discharged, my commanding officer tells me something that changes my life. He says that although I've gotten consistently high ratings over the years, without exception, none of the people who served under me would want to work with me again. He tells me that if there were an Asshole of the Decade award, I'd win by a wide margin. And that if I want to make something of myself, I need to get this fixed. In the corner of my eye, I see Wes roll his eyes at Chris, who pointedly ignores him. I know what you're thinking, Steve says, nodding at Wes. But it's one of the most crushing moments of my life and I realize that I've made a critical mistake in how I was living my life, betraying my own values. Over the next three decades, I became a constant student of building great teams that really trust one another. I did this first as a materials manager, then later as a plant manager, as head of marketing, and later as head of sales operations. Then, twelve years ago, Bob Strauss, our CEO at the time, hired me to become the new COO. Steve exhales slowly, rubbing his face, suddenly looking very tired and old. Somehow I've made the wrong turn again, just like I did in the army. I've become that person I promised myself I'd never be again. He stops talking and looks around the room. The silence goes on for a long time as we watch him stare out the window. The bright sun is starting to stream in through the conference room windows. Steve says, We have big problems in front of us that we need to fix. Eric is right. IT is not just a department. IT is a competency that we need to gain as an entire company. And I know that if we can reforge ourselves into a great team where we can all trust one another, we can succeed. He then says, Are you guys willing to do what it takes to help create a team where we can all trust one another? Steve looks around the table. I see that everyone is looking back at him with rapt attention. The silence lengthens uncomfortably. Chris is the first to speak. I'm in. Working in a screwed-up team sucks, so if you're offering to help fix it, I'm all for it. I see Patty and Wes also nodding, and then everyone turns to look at me. Chapter 19 Tuesday, September 23rd At last, I nod too. Patty says, You know, Bill, I think you've done a fantastic job in the past couple of weeks, and I'm sorry for how I reacted when you quit. I've seen such a difference in how the entire IT organization works. This is an organization that has resisted adopting any sort of process and had real problems with trust between departments. It's amazing to see, and I give most of the credit to you. I'm with her. I suppose I'm glad you're back, too, you big quitter, Wes laughs loudly. Whatever I might have said on that first day, I don't want your job. We need you here. Embarrassed, I just smile, 
acknowledging their remarks but not wanting them to blather on, saying, Okay, thanks guys. Steve nods, watching our interaction. At last he says, Let's go around the table and have each of you share something from your personal history. Where were you born? How many siblings did you have and where did you fit in? What childhood events helped form you as an adult? Steve continues, The goal of this exercise is to get to know one another as people. You've learned a bit about me and my vulnerabilities, but that's not enough. We need to know more about one another, and that creates the basis for trust. He looks around. Who wants to go first? Oh, shit. Marines don't like this kind of touchy-feely stuff. I immediately avert my eyes, not wanting to be called on first. Much to my relief, Chris volunteers. He starts off. I was born in Beirut as the youngest of three children. Before the age of eighteen, I had lived in eight different countries. As a result, I speak four languages. Chris tells us about how he and his wife tried for five years to have children, the agony of having to administer the fertility treatment injections to her, and just not being able to go through it a third time. Then he tells about the miracle of having identical twin boys, only to have complications, and having to stay with his wife in the intensive care unit for three months after they were born prematurely, and spending night after night praying that they would be okay, and not wanting one twin to live his life without the other when they were destined to be able to understand each other in a way that no other person in the world could. And how this experience taught him how selfish he was, and his newfound desire to be unselfish. To my surprise, I blink back tears, seeing Chris's earnest aspirations for his kid's future. I furtively notice others doing the same. Thank you for sharing, Chris says Steve solemnly after a moment, and then looks around the room. Who's next? To my surprise and relief, Wes goes next. I learn that he's been engaged three times in his life, and at the last minute called off each one. And when he finally does get married, he quickly got divorced because she was tired of his maniacal car racing habit. How can a guy who weighs nearly 250 pounds race cars? Wes has four cars, and even if he weren't a Parts Unlimited employee, he would be one of our most fanatic customers. He spends most of his off hours working on his Mazda Miata and old Audi that he races competitively almost every weekend. Apparently, he struggled with a lifelong battle to lose weight, even as a young child. He talked about being the outcast. He still battles his weight. Not to make friends or for his health, but to try to keep up with the skinny Asian teenage car racers half his age, even going to weight loss camp, twice. There is a long silence. I'm too nervous to laugh. Steve finally says, Thanks for sharing, Wes. Who's next? I purse my lips together and am again relieved when Patty raises her hand. We learn that she was actually an art major. She's one of those people I've made fun of all my life, but she seems so reasonable. She tells us what it's like growing up being the smart girl with big boobs and glasses, trying to decide what to do in life. She switched majors five times in college, dropping out to become a singer-songwriter in Athens, Georgia, spending two years touring clubs around the country with her band. She went back to get her MFA but after confronting the potential poverty of making a living as an artist, applied to work at Parts Unlimited. She almost didn't get the job because of a civil disobedience arrest that was still on her record. When Patty stops talking, Steve thanks her. And then, smiling at my discomfort, he says, Thank you. That leaves you, Bill. Even though I've known this moment is coming, the room seems to fade out. I hate talking about myself. In the Marines, I was able to create a persona where I could just yell at people and tell them what needed to be done. I got paid to keep my people alive by being slightly smarter than they were and having great vocal cords. 
I do not share my feelings with work colleagues, or with almost anyone for that matter. I look at the notepad in front of me, where I've been writing down ideas of what to share. All I see is nervous doodling. The silence is nearly absolute, with everyone now looking at me expectantly. Not impatiently, I see. Instead, they seem patient and kind. I see Patty's expression turn sympathetic. I purse my lips together for a moment, and then just blurt out, What influenced me most? When I realized that my mom did everything for us, and that my dad was completely undependable. He was an alcoholic, and when things weren't going well, all my brothers and sisters hid from him. But it got to a point where I finally had enough, and ran away. And I left them behind. And my youngest sister was only eight years old. I keep going. You know, getting arrested was one of the best things that ever happened to me. The alternative was having to go home, so instead I joined the Marines. That introduced me to an entirely new world, where I learned that there was a totally different way of living your life. It taught me that you could be rewarded by doing things right and taking care of your fellow soldiers. What did I learn? That my main goal is to be a great father, not like the shitty father I had. I want to be the man that my sons deserve. I feel tears starting to fall down my cheeks, which I wipe away, angry that my body is betraying me. That good enough for you, Steve? I say with a lot more anger than I had intended. Steve nods with a half-smile, saying slowly, Thank you, Bill. I know that was as difficult for you as it was for all of us. I exhale slowly and breathe deeply one more time, trying to regain some equilibrium that I hadn't realized I'd lost. The uncomfortable silence goes on. I know this isn't my place to say, Bill, Wes says slowly, but I'm pretty sure your dad would be incredibly proud of you, and he would realize what a total piece of shit he was compared to you. I hear laughter around the table, and Patty says quietly, I agree with Wes. Those kids of yours are luckier than they'll ever know. Wes grunts in agreement, and Chris nods at me, and I find myself crying for the first time in over thirty years. Embarrassed, I pull myself together and look up at everyone. I'm relieved to see everyone shifting mental gears and turning their attention back to Steve, who looks around the room. First, I'd like to thank all of you for giving of yourself and doing that exercise with me, he says. Although it's nice to get to know each of you better, I wouldn't do this if I didn't think it was important. Solving any complex business problem requires teamwork, and teamwork requires trust. Lencioni teaches that showing vulnerability helps create a foundation for that. I know it's unrealistic to think we're going to leave this meeting knowing exactly what we need to do, with priorities and owners assigned, he continues. But I would like to have a joint vision as we move toward a solution. Steve puts both hands in front of him and says, Just to get the ball rolling, I'd like to propose that one of our main problems is that we blow every commitment and schedule that we make. People outside of IT are always grumbling that we miss whatever expectations we set, by a mile. Which makes me think, he says, looking around the room, that we're probably not good at making internal commitments to one another here within IT. Thoughts? Uncomfortable silence. Look, I don't want to split hairs, Chris finally says defensively. But if you look at the actual metrics, my group has delivered almost every project on time. We make our dates. Yeah, just like you hit the Phoenix date, right? Wes says, jeering. Now that was a huge success. I heard Steve was really proud of your performance last week. Chris turns red, raising both hands in front of him. That's not what I meant. He thinks for a moment, adding, It was a total disaster, but 
technically, we did hit the date. Interesting. If that's true, I say, digging in, there's something really wrong with our definition of what a completed project is. If it means, did Chris get all his Phoenix tasks done, then it was a success. But if we wanted Phoenix in production that fulfilled the business goals without setting the entire business on fire, we should call it a total failure. Let's stop pussyfooting here, Steve interrupts. I've told Sarah that Phoenix was one of the worst executed projects in the history of our company. What's a better definition of success? Thinking for a moment, I finally say, I don't know, but this is a recurring pattern. Chris's group never factors in all the work that operations needs to do, and even when they do, they use up all the time in the schedule, leaving none for us. And we're always left cleaning up the mess long afterward. Chris nods understandingly. Well, you and I are fixing some of this. Part of it is a planning and architecture issue, which you and I have talked about fixing. But you're underestimating how much of a bottleneck your group is. We've got a bunch of other applications that need to be deployed, but because your team is tied up, all the other deployments waiting in line get delayed as well. He adds, On any given week, we've got five or six application groups waiting in line for your group to deploy something or another. And when anything goes wrong, everything gets stacked up. No offense, but when you guys are late, it's like an airport that closes down. Before you know it, you have a bunch of airplanes circling, all waiting to land. Wes grumbles loudly. Yeah, well, that's what happens when the airplane you've built crash lands, totally destroying the runway. Then Wes raises a placating hand. Look, I'm not blaming you, Chris. I'm just stating a well-known fact. When deployments don't go as planned, whether the plan was written by your group or mine, it affects everybody else. That's all I'm saying. I nod, agreeing with Wes's characterization. And surprisingly, Chris is nodding as well. I reply, Eric has helped me understand that there are four types of IT operations work. Business projects, IT operations projects, changes, and unplanned work. But we're only talking about the first type of work and the unplanned work that gets created when we do it wrong. We're only talking about half the work we do in IT operations. I turn to look at Steve, saying, I showed you our project list. On top of the 35 business projects, we've got another 75 or so ops projects we're working. We've got a backlog of thousands of changes that apparently all need to execute for some reason or another. On top of that, we have an ever-increasing amount of unplanned work, mostly caused by all our fragile applications breaking, which includes Phoenix. I say flatly, We are way over capacity given the amount of work in front of us, and we haven't even counted properly the big audit-finding remediation project yet, which Steve says is still top priority. I see the understanding start to dawn on Steve and Chris. Speaking of which... I look around, puzzled. Hey, where's John? If we're talking about compliance, shouldn't he be here too? And isn't he a part of the IT leadership team as well? Wes groans softly, rolling his eyes, saying, Oh, great. That's just who we need. Steve looks startled. He looks at the index card he was holding earlier. Then he runs his finger down a printed calendar in front of him. Shit. I forgot to invite him. Chris mutters, Well, we were getting so much done, it was probably a blessing in disguise, right? There's more uncomfortable laughter, but people seem embarrassed that we're making fun of John without him here. No, 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 that's not what I meant, Steve says quickly, looking most embarrassed of all. Bill is right, we need him here. Everyone, let's take a fifteen-minute break. I'm going to have Stacy track him down. I decide to take a walk to clear my head. When I return in ten minutes, I see the strewn remains of a corporate meeting in progress, styrofoam cups half filled with coffee, plates of leftover food, crumpled up napkins. 
Across the room, Patty and Wes are having an animated discussion with Chris. At the other end of the table, Steve is talking on his cell phone with someone, while Eric looks at the pictures of automotive parts hanging on the wall. I'm considering joining Patty and Wes when I see John walk in the room. Underneath his arm, of course, is the black three-ring binder. Stacy said you were looking for me, Steve, he said. He makes a point of looking around slowly at the evidence of a meeting started without him long ago. Did I miss a meeting notice? Or did I just get left out from yet another one? As almost everyone goes to extraordinary lengths to avoid eye contact with him, he says even more loudly, Hey, it smells like people just had sex in here. Did I miss anything good? Chris, Patty, and Wes break off their conversation, and with exaggerated nonchalance, grab their original seats. Ah, good, you're here. I'm glad you could make it, says Steve, appearing completely unfazed. Please grab a seat. Everyone, let's get started again. John, my apologies for not sending you an invite. It's completely my fault, Steve says, as he makes his way to the head of the table. I organized this meeting yesterday at the last minute, right after the audit committee meeting, after recognizing my part in making all the IT problems worse. I wanted to assemble the IT leadership team to see if we could agree on a general direction of the solution to the issues we're having around projects, operational stability, and compliance. John looks at me questioningly, lifting an eyebrow. I'm curious at Steve's omission of the vulnerability exercise and all that. Probably he figured if he can't redo it, he might as well not even bring it up. I nod reassuringly at John. Steve turns to me. Bill, please continue. When you brought up the word commitment, it reminded me of something Eric asked me last week that stuck with me, I say. He asked, on what basis do we decide whether we can accept a new project? When I said that I didn't know, he took me on another tour of MRP-8 Manufacturing Plant. He took me to Allie, the Manufacturing Resource Planning Coordinator, and asked her how she decides on whether to accept a new order. I flipped back to my notes. She said that she would first look at the order, and then look at the bill of materials and routings. Based on that, she would look at the loadings of the relevant work centers in the plant and then decide whether accepting the order would jeopardize any existing commitments. Eric asked me how we made the same type of decision in IT, I recall. I told him then, and I'll tell you now, I don't know. I'm pretty sure we don't do any sort of analysis of capacity and demand before we accept work, which means we're always scrambling, having to take shortcuts, which means more fragile applications in production, which means more unplanned work and firefighting in the future. So around and around we go. To my surprise, Eric interrupts. Well put, Bill. You've just described technical debt that is not being paid down. It comes from taking shortcuts, which may make sense in the short term, but like financial debt, the compounding interest costs grow over time. If an organization doesn't pay down its technical debt, every calorie in the organization can be spent just paying interest, in the form of unplanned work. As you know, unplanned work is not free, he continues. Quite the opposite. It's very expensive, because unplanned work comes at the expense of... He looks around professorially for an answer. Wes finally speaks up. Planned work? Yes, that's exactly right, Chester. Bill mentioned the four types of work, business projects, IT operations projects, changes, and unplanned work. Left unchecked, technical debt will ensure that the only work that gets done is unplanned work. That sure sounds like us, Wes says, nodding. He then looks firmly at Eric, saying, And it's Wes, not Chester. I'm Wes. Yes. I'm sure you are, Eric says agreeably. He addresses the rest of the room. Unplanned work has another side effect. When you spend all your time firefighting, there's little time or energy left for planning. When all you do is react, 
There's not enough time to do the hard mental work of figuring out whether you can accept new work. So, more projects are crammed onto the plate, with fewer cycles available to each one. Which means more bad multitasking, more escalations from poor code, which mean more shortcuts. As Bill said, around and around we go. It's the IT capacity death spiral. I smile to myself at Eric mangling Wes's name. I'm not sure what kind of mental game he's playing, but it's amusing to watch. Uncertain, I ask Steve, Are we even allowed to say no? Every time I've asked you to prioritize or defer work on a project, you've bitten my head off. When everyone is conditioned to believe that no isn't an acceptable answer, we all just become compliant order takers, blindly marching down a doomed path. I wonder if this is what happened to my predecessors, too. Wes and Patty nod slightly. Even Chris nods. Of course you can say no, Steve replies heatedly, with a look of genuine irritation on his face. He then takes a deep breath before saying, Let me be clear. I need you to say no. We cannot afford to have this leadership team be order takers. We pay you to think, not just do. Steve looks increasingly angry, saying, What's at stake here is the survival of the company. The outcomes of these projects dictate whether this company succeeds or fails. He looks right at me. If you, or for that matter, anyone knows that a project will fail, I need you to say so. And I need it backed up with data. Give me data like that plant coordinator showed you, so we can understand why. Sorry, Bill. I like you a lot, but saying no just based on your gut is not enough. Eric snorts and mutters, That's some pretty nice soaring rhetoric, Steve. Very moving. But you know what your problem is? You guys in the business are punch drunk on projects, taking on new work that doesn't have a prayer of succeeding. Why? Because you have no idea what capacity you actually have. You're like the guy who is always writing checks that bounce, because you don't know how much money you have and never bother opening your mail. Let me tell you a story, he says. Let me tell you about what that MRP-8 plant was like before I arrived. Those poor bastards would get these manila envelopes that would just show up, containing all sorts of crazy orders. The business would make absurd commitments to ship something at some impossible date, oblivious to all the work already in the system, he continues. It was a nightmare every day. They had inventory piled up to the ceiling. And was there a systematic way to get whip through the plant? Hell no! What got worked on was based on who yelled the loudest or most often, who could engineer the best side deals with the expediters, or who could get the ear of the highest-ranking executive. Eric is as animated as I've ever seen him. We started restoring sanity when we figured out where our constraint was. Then we protected it, making sure that time on the constraint was never wasted. And we did everything to make sure work flowed through it. Eric then grows still and merely says, To fix your problem, you need to do a lot more than just learning how to say no. That's the tip of the iceberg. We all look at him, waiting for him to keep going. But instead, he stands up, walks to his suitcase, and opens it, revealing a jumble of clothes, a snorkel, a garbage bag, and boxer shorts. He starts digging, takes out a granola bar, closes the suitcase, and returns to the table. We all watch as he opens up the granola bar package and starts eating it. Steve, looking as mystified as the rest of us, eventually says, Eric, that's an intriguing story. Please keep going. Eric sighs. No, that's all I intended to say. If you can't figure out from that what you need to do, then there's really not much hope for any of you. Steve slaps the table, exasperated. But my mind is racing. What we need to do isn't merely to prioritize better, I've already learned what the priorities are, however inconvenient. Phoenix, making the audit findings go away, all while keeping everything running. We think we know where the constraint is. It's Brent. Brent, Brent, Brent. 
and we've already taken steps to protect Brent from unplanned work. I know I can't hire more resources. I also know that the workload in my organization is totally out of control. No amount of heroics on my part can make a big dent in the tidal wave of work that's been allowed to get into the system, because no one ever said no. Our mistakes were made long before it came to me. The mistakes were made by accepting the project and all the resulting shortcuts that Chris had to make before it reached me. How can we reverse this insanity? Then a strange idea hits me. I think about it for another moment. It sounds utterly absurd, yet I can't find any flaws in the logic. I say, Steve, I have an idea, but please let me finish telling you the entire idea before you react. And I tell them what I'm thinking. Steve is the first to speak. You must be out of your right mind, Steve says, his initial disbelief turning into exasperation. You want to just stop doing work? Who do you think we are? Subsidized potato farmers paid not to grow crops? But before I can respond, John speaks up. I agree. Your idea seems like exactly the wrong thing to do. We've got a burning platform right now to finally do the right thing. We need to strike while the iron is hot. This is a perfect storm for us to finally get the budget we need to not only do the right things, but do the right things right. He starts rattling off the points on his fingers. We've got the audit finding that has board visibility, the high visibility project that can't fail, and an operational failure that can't happen again either. We should pour on the gas and put in the security controls we need, once and for all. Wes interjects, chortling to John. I'm stunned. I thought you would love Bill's idea. I mean, you love stopping things from getting done and saying no, right? This would be like a dream come true for you. John turns bright red, obviously preparing a scathing reply. But Wes puts his big, meaty hand on his shoulder and says with a smile, Hey, I'm just kidding, okay? Just making a joke. Everyone starts talking at once when Eric suddenly stands up, crumples his granola bar wrapper, and throws it across the room into the wastebasket, missing it completely. He leans back in his chair, saying, Bill. I think your proposal is very astute. Looking at John, he continues, Remember, Jimmy, the goal is to increase the throughput of the entire system, not just increase the number of tasks being done. And if you don't have a trustworthy system of work, why should I trust your system of security controls? Bah! A total waste of time. John looks back at Eric, puzzled. What? Eric sighs and rolls his eyes. Instead of responding to John, he turns his gaze to Steve. You've been a plant manager. Think of it as freezing materials release until enough whip completes and leaves the plant. In order to control this system, we need to reduce the number of moving parts. When Steve doesn't appear convinced, Eric leans forward in his chair and asks him pointedly, Suppose you're managing the MRP-8 plant, and you have inventory piled to the ceiling. What would happen if you stopped releasing jobs and materials onto the plant floor? Surprised to be the target of the question, Steve considers it for a moment. The amount of whip in the plant goes down, because work will start leaving the plant as finished goods. Correct, Eric says, nodding approvingly. And what will likely happen to due date performance? Due date performance goes up because whip went down, Steve says, looking increasingly suspicious and reluctant about where Eric might be leading him. Yes, very good, Eric says encouragingly. But on the other hand, what happens to inventory levels if you allow the plant to continue to accept orders and release new jobs? He says after a moment. Whip goes up. Excellent, Eric says. And what happens to due date performance? Steve looks like he's just swallowed something that isn't agreeing with him, and he says eventually, Everyone knows that in manufacturing, as whip increases, due date performance goes down. Wait a minute here, 
he says, squinting at Eric. You're not actually suggesting that this applies to IT, too. That by halting all work except for Phoenix will reduce the amount of whip in IT, and that this will somehow improve due date performance? Is that seriously what you're suggesting? Eric leans back in his chair, looking pleased with himself. Yes. Wes says, Won't that leave most of us just twiddling our thumbs with nothing to do? That's 130 people in IT operations just sitting around. Doesn't that sound a bit... wasteful? Eric scoffs and says, I'll tell you about wasteful. How about over a thousand changes stuck in the system, with no apparent way of ever getting them completed? Wes frowns. Then he nods, saying, That's true. The number of cards on Patty's change board keep going up. If that's work in process, it's definitely spiraling out of control. We're probably only a couple weeks away from having those cards stacked to the ceiling, too. I nod. He's right. The idea is for IT operations and development to not accept any new projects for two weeks and to stop all work in IT operations except for work related to Phoenix. I look around. If we single-task on the most important project for two weeks and still aren't able to make a big dent, then I think we should all find new day jobs. Chris nods. I think we should give it a shot. We'll keep working on the other active projects, but we'll freeze all deployment work except Phoenix. From Bill's perspective, it will look like that's the only thing we're working on. Make no mistake. Phoenix will be everyone's top priority. Patty and Wes nod in agreement. John crosses his arms. I'm not sure if I can support this insane proposal. First, I've never seen any organization do anything even remotely like this before. Second, I'm very concerned that if we do this, we'll lose our shot at getting all the audit issues fixed. As Steve already said, those audit findings could kill the company, too. You know what your problem is, Eric says, pointing a finger at John. You never see the end-to-end -end business process, so I guarantee you that many of the controls you want to put in aren't even necessary. John says, What? Again, Eric waves John's question away. Don't worry about it for now. Let the inevitable happen, and we'll see what we can learn from it. Steve turns to John. I understand your concerns about security, but the biggest risk to the company is not the unresolved audit findings. The biggest risk to the company is that we don't survive. We need Phoenix to regain competitive parity. He pauses and says, Let's give this project freeze one week and see if it makes a difference in the Phoenix work. If we don't, we'll put the remediation work back on the front burner. Okay? John nods reluctantly. He then flips to a page in his three-ring binder and makes some notes. He's probably recording Steve's promise. Steve, we definitely need your help to make this happen, I say. My guys are routinely strong-armed into doing pet projects by almost every manager in this company. I think we need an email from you to the entire company, not only explaining why you're doing this, but what the consequences will be if someone tries to put unauthorized work into the system. Eric makes an encouraging noise. No problem, Steve quickly replies. I'll send you all a draft after this meeting. Revise it, and I'll send it out to all the company managers. Good enough for you? Trying to keep the disbelief out of my voice, I say, Yes. It's astonishing what we agree to in the next hour. IT operations will freeze all non-Phoenix work. Development can't idle the 20-plus non-Phoenix projects, but will freeze all deployments. In other words, no work will flow from development to IT operations for another two weeks. Furthermore, we will identify the top areas of technical debt, which development will tackle to decrease the unplanned work being created by problematic applications in production. This will all make a huge difference in my team's workload. Furthermore, Chris and Kirsten will review all Phoenix tasks not being worked 
and steal resources from other projects to get them in work again. Everyone seemed energized and excited to put the plan into place, even John. Before we all leave, Steve says, Thank you all for your good thinking today and for sharing something about yourself. I feel like I know all of you better now. And, as unbelievable as I think Bill's crazy Project Freeze idea is, I think it could work. I look forward to this being the first of many great decisions this team will make. As I said, one of my goals is that we will create a team where we can all trust one another, he continues. Hopefully, we made a small step in that direction. And I encourage you to keep demanding honest and truthful communications between you. He looks around the room and asks, Is there anything that you guys need from me in the meantime? There are no requests, so we adjourn. As we all get up to leave, Eric says loudly, Great work, Bill. Couldn't have done it better myself. Chapter 20 Friday, September 26th Three days later, I'm at my desk, trying to read a report on Phoenix progress from Kirsten on my laptop. As it whirs and wheezes, I wonder how many weeks it's been since John's security patch bricked my laptop. Getting replacement laptops is like a lottery. It's tempting to bribe one of the service desk people, as one of the marketing managers suggested, but I refuse to jump the queue. I have to keep playing by the rules, since I'm the person responsible for making and enforcing them. I make a note to talk with Patty about our urgent need to reduce lead times on these laptop replacements. Finally, the email comes up. From Kirsten Fingal, to Steve Masters, CC Bill Palmer, Chris Allers, Sarah Moulton. Date, September 26, 10.33 a.m. Subject, Great News on Project Front. Steve, we are finally making headway. The project freeze and the resulting IT focus on Phoenix has broken the logjam. We've accomplished more in the previous seven days than we typically get done in an entire month. Kudos to everyone on the team. On a side note, many project sponsors are very frustrated about their projects being put on hold. In particular, Sarah Moulton believes that her projects are exempt from the freeze. I referred her to you. Attached is the formal status report. Please let me know if you have any questions. Kirsten Although the note about Sarah making trouble again makes my jaw clench, this is absolutely fantastic news. We were expecting it, but the good news is welcome nonetheless, especially after earlier in the week. We had a big setback because of a SEV-1 incident that took out all the internal phone and voicemail systems, bringing sales and marketing to its knees on the last day of the quarter. Two hours into the outage, we discovered it was caused by one of our networking vendors who accidentally made a change to our production phone system instead of the hot spare. The outage will impact our quarterly revenue, but we don't know how much yet. In order to prevent this from happening again, we're putting together a project to monitor our critical systems for unauthorized changes. This monitoring project is what Wes, Patty, and John are talking about, huddled around Patty's conference table. I say, Sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to share the good news. I show them Kirsten's email. Wes leans back and says, Well, that makes it official. Your project freeze is actually working. Patty looks over at him, appearing surprised. You actually doubted it? Come on, we've both been talking about how we've never seen people so focused before. It's amazing how the Project Freeze has reduced the priority conflicts and bad multitasking. We know it's made a huge difference in productivity. Wes shrugs, then smiles. Until Kirsten gives us credit, it's all just in our heads. He's got a point. It really is great to have Kirsten acknowledge the progress we're making. By the way, Patty says, she is not kidding about the business managers freaking out. I've had more and more VPs calling me, demanding a waiver for their various pet projects, or asking me to get some work done off the books. It's not just Sarah. She's just the most blatant and vocal. I frown. Okay, that's part of our job and we expected this. But I don't want this kind of pressure being applied to any of our people. Wes? I've told everyone on my team that they're to route any complaints to me, 
And trust me, I call each of those guys back and give them an earful, he says. Patty says, I'm already getting anxious about what we do after we lift the project freeze. Won't that be like opening up the floodgates? Once again, she has put her finger on something important. I say, I'll call Eric, but before I do, how do we currently prioritize our work? When we commit to work on a project, a change, a service request, or anything else, how does anyone decide what to work on at any given time? What happens if there are competing priorities? That happens every freaking day, says Wes, looking incredulous. That's what's so great about freezing all the projects except for one. No one has to decide what they're working on. No multitasking allowed. That's not my question, I say. When we have multiple streams of work going on simultaneously, how does anyone decide what needs to get worked on at any given time? Well, Wes says, we trust them to make the right decision based on the data they have. That's why we hire smart people. This is not good. Recalling my twenty minutes observing Brent before the project freeze, I ask, and on what data do all our smart people base their prioritization decisions? Wes says defensively, We all try to juggle the competing priorities as best as we can. That's life, right? Priorities change. Let's be honest, Patty says. Priority one is whoever is yelling the loudest with the tiebreaker being who can escalate to the most senior executive. Except when they're more subtle. I've seen a bunch of my staff always prioritizing a certain manager's requests because he takes them out to lunch once a month. Oh, great. In addition to some engineers being bullied, I have other engineers who are like Corporal Max Klinger from MASH, running their own black market of IT work. If this is true, there's no way we can lift the project freeze. Don't you see that we don't have any way of releasing work into IT and be able to trust that it will get worked on? Trying to keep the resignation out of my voice, I say. Patty is right. We have a lot to figure out before the project freeze ends, which is in exactly one week. I decide to take a quick walk outside. I have 30 minutes before my next meeting, and I need to think. I'm more unsettled than ever. When we have more than one project in the system at the same time, how do we protect the work from being interrupted or having its priority trumped by almost anyone in the business or someone else in IT? The sun shines down on me. It's 11 a.m., and the air smells like autumn. The leaves on the trees are starting to turn orange and brown, and there are piles of them starting to form in the parking lot. Despite my fretting, I realize how refreshing it is to be able to think about what work we need to be doing and how to prioritize and release it. For a moment, I marvel at the lack of constant firefighting that dominated so much of my career in IT. The types of issues we're having to solve lately are so... cerebral. It's what I thought management was all about when I got my MBA. I'm convinced that if we do a good job thinking... We can make a real difference. In that moment, I decide to call Eric. Hello, I hear him say. Hi, it's Bill. Do you have a couple of minutes to talk? I have some questions about the project freeze. I pause and then add, Or rather, what happens after we lift the project freeze? Well, it's about time. I was wondering when you'd figure out that you have a huge new problem on your hands. I quickly fill him in on the good news from Kirsten. I outline the problems we've stumbled upon while we consider the monitoring project and how we protect work in the system. Not bad, Junior, Eric says. You've obviously put our discussion about constraints into practice and are doing everything you can to protect that constraint from being hit by unplanned work. You're asking some very important questions about the first way and how you manage your flow of planned work. Until you can do that, you can't really manage much of anything, can you? You're confused because you're realizing you don't know how work is actually worked, he continues. I suppress an irritated sigh.
I think it's time for another trip to MRP-8. How soon can you get there? He asks. Surprised, I ask, You're in town? Yep, he says. There's a meeting with the auditors and the finance guys this afternoon that I wouldn't miss for the world. Make sure you're there for it. We're going to make John's head fall off. I tell him that I can be at MRP-8 in 15 minutes. Eric's in the middle of the lobby waiting for me. I do a double take. He's wearing a faded t-shirt and a zippered hooded sweatshirt with a faded union logo. He already has a visitor badge and is tapping his foot impatiently. I came as fast as I could, I say. Eric merely grunts and gestures for me to follow him. Again, we climb the staircase and stand on the catwalk, overlooking the plant floor. So, tell me what you see, he says, gesturing toward the plant floor. I look down, confused, not knowing what he wants to hear. Starting with the obvious, I say, Like last time, I see raw materials coming in from the loading docks on the left, and on the right I see finished goods leaving the other set of loading docks. Surprisingly, Eric nods approvingly. Good? And in between? I look down at the scene. Part of me feels foolish, afraid of looking like the karate kid being quizzed by Mr. Miyagi. But I asked for this meeting, so I just start talking. I see materials and work in process, flowing from left to right, but obviously moving very slowly. Eric peers over the catwalk and says, Oh, really? Like some sort of river? He turns to me, shaking his head with disgust. What do you think this is? Some sort of poetry reading class? Suddenly, whip is like water running over smooth stones. Get serious. How would a plant manager answer the question? From where to where does the work go, and why? Trying again, I say, Okay, okay. Whip goes from work center to work center, as dictated by the bill of materials and routings. And all that is in the job order, which was released at that desk over there. That's better, Eric says. And can you find the work centers where the plant constraints are? I know that Eric had told me on that first odd trip to this plant. The heat treat ovens and paint curing booths, I say suddenly. There, I say, after scanning the plant floor and finally spotting a set of large machines by the far wall. And there, I say pointing at the large rooms with signs saying Paint Booth Number 30-A and Paint Booth Number 30-B. Good. Understanding the flow of work is key to achieving the first way, Eric says, nodding. More sternly, he says, So now, tell me again which work centers you've determined to be the constraints in your organization. I smile, answering easily. Brent, we talked about that before. He scoffs, turning back to look at the plant floor. What? I nearly shout. How can it not be Brent? You even congratulated me when I told you it was Brent a couple of weeks ago. Suddenly, Brent is a robotic heat treat oven? You're telling me your equivalent of that plant curing booth down there is Brent? He says with mock disbelief. You know... That might be the dumbest thing I've ever heard. He continues. So, where would that leave your two managers, Chester and Penelope? Let me guess. Maybe they're equivalent to that drill press station and that stamping machine over there. Or maybe it's that metal grinder. Eric looks sternly at me. Get serious. I asked you what work centers are your constraints. Think. Completely confused, I look back down at the plant floor. I know that part of the answer is Brent. But when I blurt it out so confidently, Eric all but smacks me on the head. Again. Eric seems aggravated that I named an actual person, suggesting that Brent was a piece of equipment. I look again at the heat treat oven, and then I see them. There are two people wearing coveralls, hard hats, and goggles, 
One is in front of a computer screen, punching in something, while the other is inspecting a pile of parts on a loading pallet, scanning something with his handheld computer. Oh, I say, thinking out loud. The heat treat oven is a work center, which has workers associated with it. You asked what work centers are our constraints, and I told you that it was Brent, which can't be right, because Brent isn't a work center. Brent is a worker, not a work center, I say again. And I'm betting that Brent is probably a worker supporting way too many work centers, which is why he's a constraint. Now we're getting somewhere, Eric says, smiling. Gesturing broadly at the plant floor below, he says, Imagine if 25% of all the work centers down there could only be operated by one person named Brent. What would happen to the flow of work? I close my eyes to think. Work wouldn't complete on time, because Brent can only be at one work center at a time, I say. Enthusiastically, I continue. That's exactly what's happening with us. I know that for a bunch of our planned changes, work can't even start if Brent isn't on hand. When that happens, we'll escalate to Brent, telling him to drop whatever he's doing, so some other work center can get going. We'll be lucky if he can stay there long enough for the change to be completely implemented before he's interrupted by someone else. Exactly, he says. I'm slightly dismayed at the warm feeling of approval that I feel in response. Obviously, he continues, every work center is made up of four things, the machine, the man, the method, and the measures. Suppose for the machine, we select the heat treat oven. The men are the two people required to execute the predefined steps, and we obviously will need measures based on the outcomes of executing the steps in the method. I frown. These factory terms are vaguely familiar from my MBA years, but I never thought they'd be relevant in the IT domain. Looking for some way to write this down, I realize I left my clipboard in my car. I pat my pockets and find a small crumpled index card in my back pocket. I hurriedly write down, Work center, machine, man, method, measure. Eric continues, Of course, on this plant floor, you don't have one quarter of the work centers dependent upon one person. That would be absurd. Unfortunately for you, you do. That's why when Brent takes a vacation, all sorts of work will just grind to a halt. Because only Brent knows how to complete certain steps. Steps that probably only Brent even knew existed, right? I nod, unable to resist groaning. You're right. I've heard my managers complain that if Brent were hit by the proverbial bus, we'd be completely up the creek. No one knows what's in Brent's head, which is one of the reasons I've created the Level 3 Escalation Pool. I quickly explain what I did to prevent escalations to Brent during outages, to keep him from being interrupted by unplanned work, and how I've attempted to do the same thing for planned changes. Good, he says. You're standardizing Brent's work so that other people can execute it. And because you're finally getting those steps documented, you're able to enforce some level of consistency and quality as well. You're not only reducing the number of work centers where Brent is required, you're generating documentation that will enable you to automate some of them. He continues, Incidentally, until you do this, no matter how many more Brents you hire, Brent will always remain your constraint. Anyone you hire will just end up standing around. I nod in understanding. This is exactly as Wes described it. Even though he got the additional headcount to hire more Brents, we never were able to actually increase our throughput. I feel a sudden sense of exhilaration as the pieces fall into place in my head. He's confirming some of my deeply held intuitions and providing an underpinning theory for why I believe them. My elation is short-lived. He looks me over disapprovingly. You're asking about how to lift the project freeze. Your problem is that you keep confusing two things. Until you can separate them in your head, you'll just walk around in circles. He starts walking, and I hurry after him. Soon we're standing over the middle of the plant floor. 
You see that work center over there, with the yellow blinking light? He asks, pointing. When I nod, he says, Tell me what you see. Wondering what it would take to have a normal conversation with him, I resume my dumb trainee role. Some piece of machinery is apparently down. That's what I'm guessing the blinking light indicates. There are five people huddled off to the side, including what looks like two managers. They all look concerned. There are three more people crouched down, looking into what I'm guessing is the machine inspection panel. They have flashlights and... Yeah, they're also holding screwdrivers, definitely a machine down. Good guess, he says. That's probably a computerized grinder that is out of commission, and the maintenance team is working on getting it back online. What would happen if every piece of equipment down there needs Brent to fix it? I laugh. Every outage escalated immediately to Brent. Yes, he continues. Let's start with your first question. Which projects are safe to release when the project freeze is lifted? Knowing how work flows through certain work centers and how some work centers require Brent and some do not, what do you think the answer is? I slowly repeat what Eric just recited, trying to piece together the answer. I got it, I say, smiling. The candidate projects which are safe to release are those that don't require Brent. I smile even wider when he says, Bingo. Pretty simple, yes? My smile disappears as I think through the implications. Wait, how do I know which projects don't require Brent? We never think we actually need Brent until we're halfway through the work. I immediately regret asking the question as Eric glares at me. I'm supposed to give you the answer to everything that you're too disorganized to be able to figure out for yourself? Sorry. I'll figure it out, I say quickly. You know, I'll be so relieved when we finally know all the work that actually requires Brent. Damn right, he says. What you're building is the bill of materials for all the work that you do in IT operations. But instead of a list of parts and sub-assemblies, like moldings, screws, and casters, you're cataloging all the prerequisites of what you need before you can complete the work like laptop model numbers, specifications of user information, the software and licenses needed, their configurations, version information, the security and capacity and continuity requirements, yada yada. He interrupts himself, saying, Well, to be more accurate, you're actually building a bill of resources. That's the bill of materials along with the list of the required work centers and the routing. Once you have that, Along with the work orders and your resources, you'll finally be able to get a handle on what your capacity and demand is. This is what will enable you to finally know whether you can accept new work, and then actually be able to schedule the work. Amazing. I think I almost get it. I'm about to ask some questions, but Eric says, Your second question was whether it was safe to start your monitoring project. You already established it doesn't require Brent. Furthermore, you say that the goal of this project is to prevent outages, which prevents Brent escalations. More than that, when outages do occur, you'll need less of Brent's time to troubleshoot and fix. You've already identified the constraint, exploited it to squeeze the most out of it, and then you've subordinated the flow of work to the constraint. So, how important is this monitoring project? I think for a moment, and then groan at the obvious answer. I run my fingers through my hair. You said that we always need to be looking for ways to elevate the constraint, which means I need to do whatever is required to get more cycles from Brent. That's exactly what the monitoring project does. I say with some disbelief that I didn't see this before, the monitoring project is probably the most important improvement project we have. We need to start this project right away. Precisely, Eric says. Properly elevating preventative work is at the heart of programs like Total Productive Maintenance, which has been embraced by the lean community. 
TPM insists that we do whatever it takes to assure machine availability by elevating maintenance. As one of my senseis would say, improving daily work is even more important than doing daily work. The third way is all about ensuring that we're continually putting tension into the system, so that we're continually reinforcing habits and improving something. Resilience engineering tells us that we should routinely inject faults into the system, doing them frequently to make them less painful. Mike Rother says that it almost doesn't matter what you improve, as long as you're improving something. Why? Because if you are not improving, entropy guarantees that you are actually getting worse, which ensures that there is no path to zero errors, zero work-related accidents, and zero loss. Suddenly, it's so obvious and evident. I feel like I need to call Patty right away to tell her to start the monitoring project immediately. Eric continues. Rother calls this the improvement kata, he continues. He used the word kata because he understood that repetition creates habits, and habits are what enable mastery. Whether you're talking about sports training, learning a musical instrument, or training in the special forces, nothing is more to mastery than practice and drills. Studies have shown that practicing five minutes daily is better than practicing once a week for three hours. And if you want to create a genuine culture of improvement, you must create those habits. Turning back to the plant floor, he continues, Before we leave, turn your attention from the work centers to all the space between the work centers. Just as important as throttling the release of work is managing the handoffs, the wait time for a given resource is the percentage that resource is busy divided by the percentage that resource is idle. So, if a resource is 50% utilized, the wait time is 50 divided by 50, or one unit. If the resource is 90% utilized, the wait time is 90 divided by 10, or nine times longer. And if the resource is 99% utilized? Although I'm not quite understanding the relevance, I do the math in my head. 99 over 1. I say, 99. Correct, he says. When a resource is 99% utilized, you have to wait 99 times as long as if that resource is 50% utilized. He gestures expansively. A critical part of the second way is making wait times visible, so you know when your work spends days sitting in someone's queue. Or worse, when work has to go backward because it doesn't have all the parts or requires rework. Remember that our goal is to maximize flow. Here at MRP8, we had a situation many years ago where certain components were never showing up at final assembly on time. Was it because we didn't have enough resources or because certain tasks were taking too long? No! When we actually followed the parts around on the plant floor, we found that for the majority of time, the parts were just sitting in queues. In other words... The touch time was a tiny fraction of total process time. Our expediters had to search through mountains of work to find the parts and push them through the work center, he says incredulously. That's happening at your plant too, so watch for it, he says. I nod and say, Eric, I'm still stuck on releasing the monitoring project. People always insist that their special project is urgent and needs to be worked at the expense of everything else. Where do all the urgent audit and security remediation projects that John is screaming for fit in? Eric looks intently at my face and finally says, Have you heard a single word I've been saying in the last two weeks? He looks at his watch and says, Gotta go. Startled, I watch him as he walks quickly to the catwalk exit. I have to run to catch him. He's a big guy, probably a little over fifty years old. Despite the extra pounds he's carrying, he moves fast. When I catch up to him, I say, Wait, are you saying that audit issues aren't important enough to fix? I never said that, he says, stopping in his tracks and turning to face me. You screw up something that jeopardizes the business's ability to maintain compliance with relevant laws and regulations? You better fix it or you should be fired.
he turns around and resumes his pace, saying over his shoulder, Tell me, all those projects that Jimmy or CISO is pushing, do they increase the flow of project work through the IT organization? No, I quickly answer, rushing to catch up again. Do they increase operational stability or decrease the time required to detect and recover from outages or security breaches? I think a bit longer. Probably not. A lot of it is just more busy work, and in most cases, the work they're asking for is risky and actually could cause outages. Do these projects increase Brent's capacity? I laugh humorously. No, the opposite. The audit issues alone could tie up Brent for the next year. And what would doing all of Jimmy's projects do to whip levels? He asks, opening the door that takes us back into the stairwell. Exasperated, I say as we descend the two set of stairs. It would go through the roof, again. When we reach the bottom, Eric suddenly stops and asks, Okay, these security projects decrease your project throughput, which is the constraint for the entire business, and swamp the most constrained resource in your organization. And they don't do squat for scalability, availability, survivability, sustainability, security, supportability, or the defensibility of the organization. He asks deadpan. So, genius, do Jimmy's projects sound like a good use of time to you? As I start to answer, he just opens the exit door and walks through it. Apparently, it was a rhetorical question. Chapter 21 Friday, September 26th Despite breaking every speed limit on the way, I'm 20 minutes late to the audit meeting in Building 2. When I step into the conference room, I'm stunned at how packed it is. It's immediately obvious that this is a high-stakes meeting, fraught with political nuance. Dick and our corporate counsel are at the head of the table. Opposite them are the external auditors who are legally liable for finding financial reporting errors and fraud, and yet they still want to keep us as clients. Dick and his team will try to show that everything the auditors have found is all a genuine misunderstanding. Their goal is to appear earnest but indignant that their precious time is being wasted. It's all political theater, but high-stakes political theater that is definitely above my pay grade. Anne and Nancy are also here, along with Wes and some other folks who look familiar. Then I see John and do a double-take. My God, he looks terrible. Like someone on his third day of quitting an addiction. He looks as if he thinks that the entire room will turn on him at a moment's notice and tear him to shreds, which may not be that far from the truth. Sitting next to John is Eric, who is the picture of composure. How did he get here so quickly? And where did he change into those khaki pants and denim shirt? In the car? While he was walking? As I sit down next to Wes, he leans toward me. He gestures at a stapled set of papers and whispers. The agenda for this meeting is to go through these two material weaknesses and the sixteen significant deficiencies. There's John, looking like he's in front of the firing squad, waiting for the bullet. I see the sweat stains under John's arms and think to myself, Good grief, John. Pull yourself together. I'm the operational manager where all those IT deficiencies reside, so I'm actually the one on the firing line, not you. But unlike John, I've had the benefit of having Eric's constant reassurances that everything will work out. Then again, Eric doesn't have his ass on the line, and for a brief moment I wonder whether I should be as nervous as John. Five hours later, the conference table is covered with marked-up papers and empty cups of coffee, the room smelling stale and rank from all the tension and heated arguments. I look up at the sound of the audit partner closing his briefcase. He says to Dick, Given this new data... It does appear that for the two potential material weaknesses, the IT controls may indeed be out of scope and thus can be resolved very quickly. Thank you in advance for making yourselves available to get us the documentation we need to close out these issues as expeditiously as possible. 
We will take all this under advisement and send you something in the next day or two, he continues. Most likely, we'll want to schedule further testing of these newly documented downstream controls to make sure they were in place and operating, to support the financial statement assertions you're making. As he stands up, I stare in disbelief at the audit partner. We really dodged the bullet. Looking around the table, the Parts Unlimited team looks equally surprised. One exception is Eric, who just nods approvingly, obviously irritated that it took so long to finally have the auditors on the run. The other exception is John. He looks extremely distraught, sitting with his shoulders slumped over, that I'm suddenly concerned about his well-being. I'm about to get up to check on John when the audit partner shakes Dick's hand and, to my surprise, Eric gets up to give him a hug. Eric, it's been a long time since Gate and Orlando, the audit partner says warmly. I was sure our paths would cross again, but I never would have guessed it would be at a client engagement. What have you been up to lately? Eric laughs and says, Mostly happily sailing on my boat. A friend asked me to join the Parts Unlimited board, partly due to their external auditors making trouble with a bunch of young, bottom-up auditors who strayed off the reservation. I should have known you'd be involved. The audit partner looks genuinely embarrassed, and they huddle together, whispering. For the past five hours, John, Wes, and I sat on the sidelines while the business managers walked the auditors through a precise discussion about how the IT control issues simply couldn't lead to an undetected financial reporting error. They pulled out something called the Gate Principles document and cited some of the enclosed flowcharts. Like watching a tennis match, the ball went back and forth between our team and the auditors, using words like linkage, significance, and controls reliance. On occasion, Dick would trot in a bunch of experts from the relevant business areas to show that even if someone malicious managed to cause a failure in the IT control, the fraud would still be caught by another control somewhere downstream. Managers from materials management, order entry, treasury, and human resources showed that even if the application, database, operating system, and firewall were riddled with security holes and thoroughly compromised, the fraudulent transaction would still be caught by some daily or weekly inventory reconciliation report. Over and over again, they went through scenarios that assumed all the IT infrastructure was made of Swiss cheese, where any disgruntled or wrongdoing employee or external malicious hacker could log in and commit fraud with impunity but they would still detect any material error in the financial statements. Once, Dick pointed out that an entire department of 20 people is responsible for spotting erroneous, let alone fraudulent orders. They, and not an IT control, served as the business safety net. Each time, the auditors, often reluctantly, agreed that Control's reliance was placed on finance doing reconciliations, and not on the IT systems or the IT controls within. This was news to me. But I certainly wasn't going to disagree with them. In fact, if shutting up and staying silent would allow Parts Unlimited to escape all the audit findings, I'd be happy to drool and pretend to be unable to read. You have a minute to talk, I hear John say beside me in a scratchy voice. He still slumped over, his head in his hands. Sure, I say, looking around at the nearly empty room. It's just John and me at the large conference table, while Eric continues his whispered powwow with the audit partner in the far corner. John looks awful. If his shirt were just a little more wrinkled, and maybe had a stain or two in front, he could almost pass as a homeless person. John, are you coming down with something? You don't look so hot. I say. His expression turns ugly. Do you know how much political capital I've spent over the last two years trying to get everyone to do the right thing? This organization has been kicking the information security can down the road for a decade. I put absolutely everything on the line. 
I told them the world would end if they didn't go beyond lip service and at least try to fix some of these systemic IT security issues. I mean, we need to at least pretend to care. From the other side of the room, I see Eric turn to look at us. The audit partner doesn't seem to have heard John. Nevertheless, Eric puts his arm around him and collegially moves the conversation into the hallway, closing the door loudly behind him. Oblivious, John continues. You know, there are times when I think I'm the only person in this entire company that actually cares about security of our systems and data. Do you know how it feels to have the entire dev organization hiding their activities from me and having to beg people to tell me where they're meeting? What is this, elementary school? I'm only trying to help them do their jobs. When I don't say anything, he just sneers at me. Don't look at me like that. I know you look down at me, Bill. I look at him with genuine surprise. I know you never read my emails. I have to call you to even get you to open them up. I know, because I get the red receipts while we're on the phone, you asshole. Ah. Uh, but I've read many of his emails without him having to call me first. However, before I can respond, he barrels forward. You all look down on me. You know, I used to manage servers, just like you do. But I found my calling doing information security. I wanted to help catch bad guys. I wanted to help organizations protect themselves from people who were out to get them. It came out of a sense of duty and a desire to make the world a better place. But ever since I've been here... All I do is fight the corporate bureaucracy and the business, even though I'm trying to protect them from themselves. Laughing harshly, he says, The auditors were supposed to put the screws on us. They were supposed to punish us sinners for our ungodly ways. And you know what? All afternoon, we just watch the audit partner pamper us with kid gloves. What is the point of even having an information security program at all? Even the auditors don't care. Everything just got brushed under the rug for the cost of a golf game. John is almost shouting. Our auditors should be put on trial for incompetence. All those findings they dismissed were basic hygiene issues. We live in a churning cesspool of risk. I'm amazed this place doesn't just collapse under its own weight from lack of caring. I've waited for years for everything to come crashing down upon us. He pauses, whispering. And yet... Here we still are. Just then, Eric enters the room again, slamming the door behind him. He grabs the seat closest to the door and looks sternly at John. You know what your problem is, Jimmy? Eric says, pointing the finger at him. You are like the political commissar who walks onto the plant floor, proudly flashing your badge at all the line workers, sadistically poking your nose in everybody's business and intimidating them into doing your bidding just to increase your own puny sense of self-worth. Half the time, you break more than you fix. Worse, you screw up the work schedules of everyone who's actually doing important work. This is going way overboard. John sputters. Who do you think you are? I'm trying to keep this organization secure and keep the auditors away. I'm... Why, thank you for nothing, Mr. CISO, Eric says, interrupting him. As you just observed, the organization can keep the auditors away without you having to do anything at all. You are like the plumber who doesn't even realize that you're servicing an airplane, let alone the route you're flying or the business condition of the airline. By now, John is white as a sheet, his jaw hanging open. I'm about to intervene on his behalf when Eric stands up and shouts to John, I don't have anything further to say to you until you prove to me that you understand what just happened in this room. The business managed to dodge the SOX 404 audit bullet without any help from your team. Until you figure out how and why, you don't have any business interfering with the daily operations of this organization. This should be your guiding principle. You win when you protect the organization without putting meaningless work into the IT system. And you win even more when you can take meaningless work out of the IT system. 
He then turns to me and says, Bill, you just may be right. You guys around here sure seem to have completely screwed up information security. I never said any such thing. I turn to look at John, intending to convey that I have no idea what he's talking about, but John doesn't notice me. He's staring at Eric with an expression of intense hatred on his face. Eric says to me, pointing his thumb at John, This guy is like the QA manager who has his group writing millions of new tests for a product we don't even ship anymore, and then files millions of bug reports for features that no longer exist. Obviously, he is making what you and I would call a scoping error. John is shaking with outrage. He says, how dare you? As a potential board director, I can't believe you're telling us to put our customer data and financial statements at risk. Eric looks calmly back at John. You really don't get it, do you? The biggest risk to Parts Unlimited is going out of business. And you seem hell-bent on making it go out of business even faster, with all your ill-conceived, irrelevant technical minutiae. No wonder you've been marginalized. Everyone else is at least trying to help the business survive. If this were an episode of Survivor, you'd have been voted off a long time ago. By now, Eric is standing over John. Jimmy, Parts Unlimited has at least four of my family's credit card numbers in your systems. I need you to protect that data. But you'll never adequately protect it when the work product is already in production. You need to protect it in the processes that create the work product. Putting his hands in his pockets, he says more softly, You want a clue? Go to MRP-8 plant and find the plant safety officer. Go talk to her. Find out what she's trying to accomplish and how she does it. Eric's expression brightens slightly, and he adds, And please convey my regards to her. I'll be ready to talk with you again when Dick says he actually wants you around. With that, he walks out the door. John looks at me. What the hell? Pulling myself out of my chair, I say, Don't let it get to you. He says similar things to me. I'm exhausted and I'm going home. I suggest you do the same. John stands up wordlessly. With the calm expression remaining on his face, he pushes the three-ring binder off the table. It hits the ground with a large thump, all the contents scattering everywhere. Hundreds of pages are now strewn across the floor. He looks at me with a humorless smile and says, I will. Go home, that is. I don't know if I'll be in tomorrow. Or ever. What's the point, really? He then walks out of the room. I stare at John's binder, not quite believing he discarded it so carelessly. He's been carrying it around for over two years. In front of where he was sitting is a single piece of paper, almost blank, with a few lines scribbled on it. Wondering if it's a suicide note or a resignation letter, I sneak a quick peek at what appears to be a poem. A haiku? Here I sit, hands tied, room angry, I could save them, if only they knew. Chapter 22 Monday, September 29th The Monday following the audit meeting, John disappeared. There was a betting pool in the knock speculating whether he suffered a nervous breakdown, was fired, is just hiding or worse. I see Wes and some of his engineers all laughing loudly, presumably at John's expense. I clear my throat to get Wes's attention. When he walks over... I turn around so that my back is to the knock, shielding everyone from hearing what I'm telling Wes. Do me a favor. Don't fan the rumor mill about John. Remember what Steve was trying to impress upon us at the offsite. We need to build a mutually respectful and trusted working relationship with him. Wes's smile disappears, and after a moment he finally says, Yeah, I know. I'm just kidding, okay? Good, I say, nodding. Okay, enough of that. Follow me. I need to talk to you and Patty about the monitoring project. 
We go to her office, where she's sitting at her desk, typing away in a project management application, full of Gantt charts. Got a half hour? I ask her. When she nods, we gather around her conference table. I say, I talked with Eric on Friday before the audit meeting. Here's what I learned. I tell them how Eric validated that we can release the monitoring project and how important this project is to further elevate Brent. I then try to explain the thought process of how we can determine which projects we can safely release based on whether they have any dependencies on Brent. Wait a second. Bill of resources and routings? Wes says, suddenly looking very dubious. Bill, I don't need to remind you that we're not running a factory here. This is IT work. We use our brains to get things done, not our hands. I know Eric has said a couple of smart things here and there, but come on. This sounds like some sort of consultant parlor trick. Look, I'm having trouble getting my head around this too, I say. But can you really say that the conclusions we're making based on his thinking are wrong? Do you think it's unsafe to release the monitoring project? Patty wrinkles her forehead. We know that IT work can be projects or changes, and in many of the projects there are many tasks or sub-projects that show up over and over again, like setting up a server. It's recurring work. I guess you could call that a sub-assembly. She stands up, walks to the whiteboard, and draws some boxes. Let's use the example of configuring a server. It involves procurement, installing the OS and applications on it according to some specification, and then getting it racked and stacked. Then we validate that it's been built correctly. Each of these steps are typically done by different people. Maybe each step is like a work center, each with its own machines, methods, men, and measures. With less certainty, she continues, but I'm not sure if I know what the machine would be. I smile as Patty scrawls on the board. She's making some leaps that I haven't been able to make. I don't know where she'll end up, but I think she's on the right track. Maybe the machine, I speculate, is the tools necessary to do the work? The virtualization management consoles, terminal sessions, and maybe the virtual disk space that we attach to it? Patty shakes her head. Maybe. The consoles and terminals sound like they could be the machine. And I think disk space, the applications, license keys, and so forth are all actually inputs or the raw materials needed to create the outputs. She stares at the whiteboard. At last, she says, I suspect that until we do a couple of these, we'll just be stumbling in the dark. I'm starting to think that this whole work center notion actually describes IT work pretty well. For this server setup example, we know that it's a work center that gets hit by almost every business and IT project. If we nail this down, we'll actually be able to provide better estimates to Kirsten and all her project managers. Give me a break, guys, Wes says. First, our work is not repetitive. Second, it requires a lot of knowledge unlike the people who just assemble parts or tighten screws. We hire very smart people with experience. Trust me, we can't standardize our work like manufacturing does. I consider Wes's point. Last week, I think I would have agreed with you, Wes. But I watched one of the final assembly work centers on the manufacturing floor for 15 minutes last week. I was overwhelmed with everything that was going on. Frankly, I could barely keep up with it. Despite trying to make everything repetitive and repeatable, they still had to do an incredible amount of improvisation and problem-solving just to hit their daily production goals. They're doing a whole lot more than tightening screws. They're performing heroics every day, using every bit of experience and smarts they have. I say adamantly, they really earned my respect. If it weren't for them, we all wouldn't even have jobs. I think we have a lot to learn from plant floor management. I pause. Let's start the monitoring project as soon as we can. The sooner we start, the sooner we'll get the benefits. We need to protect each of our resources as if they were all Brent's. So let's get this done. There's one more thing, Patty says. I keep thinking about the lanes of work we're trying to create. I'd like to test some of these concepts with the incoming service requests. 
like account ad change deletes, password resets, and, you know, laptop replacements. She looks uncomfortably at my giant laptop, which is in even worse shape than when I first got it three weeks ago. I've had to put even more duct tape on it to keep it from falling apart, due to some further damage I caused when I used my car keys to pry it open. And now, half the paint on the screen lid has flaked off. Oh, for crying out loud, Wes groans, looking at it, genuinely embarrassed. I can't believe we haven't gotten you a replacement. We don't suck that much. Patty, I'll find someone for you to dedicate to the laptop and desktop backlog. Fantastic, Patty replies. I have a little experiment in mind that I'd like to try out. Not wanting to get in the way, I say, make it so. When I get to the office on the following Monday, Patty is waiting for me. You have a second? She asks, obviously eager to show me something. Next thing I know, I'm standing in Patty's change coordination room. I immediately spot on the back wall a new board. On it, index cards arranged in four rows. The rows are labeled Move Worker Office, Add Change Delete Account, Provision New Desktop Laptop, and Reset Password. Each row has been divided up into three columns, labeled Ready, Doing, and Done. Interesting. This looks vaguely familiar. What is this, another change board? Patty breaks out into a grin and says, It's a Kanban board. After our last meeting, I went to MRP8 myself. I was so curious about this work center notion that I had to see it in action. I managed to find one of the supervisors that I've worked with before, and he spent an hour with me showing how they managed the flow of work. Patty explains that a Kanban board, among many other things, is one of the primary ways our manufacturing plants schedule and pull work through the system. It makes demand and whip visible, and is used to signal upstream and downstream stations. I'm experimenting with putting Kanbans around our key resources. Any activities they work on must go through the Kanban, not by email, instant message, telephone, or whatever. If it's not on the Kanban board, it won't get done, she says. And more importantly, if it is on the Kanban board, it will get done quickly. You'd be amazed at how fast work is getting completed because we're limiting the work in process. Based on our experiments so far, I think we're going to be able to predict lead times for work and get faster throughput than ever. That Patty is now sounding a bit like Eric is both unsettling and exciting. What I've done, she continues, is take some of our most frequent service requests, documented exactly what the steps are and what resources can execute them, and timed how long each operation takes. Here's the result. She hands me a piece of paper proudly. It's titled, Laptop Replacement Queue. On it is a list of everyone who's requested either a new or replacement laptop or desktop, along with when they submitted the request and the projected date they'll receive it. They're sorted by the oldest requests first. I'm apparently 14th in line, with my desktop projected to arrive four days from now. You actually believe this schedule? I say, trying to be skeptical. However, it really would be fantastic if we could actually publish this to everyone and be able to hit those dates. We worked on this all weekend long, she replies. Based on the trials we've done since Friday, we're pretty confident that we understand the time required to go from start to finish. We've even figured out how to save a bunch of steps by changing where we're doing disk mirroring. Between you and me, based on the time savings we're generating, I think that we'll beat these dates. She shakes her head. You know, I did a quick poll of people we've issued laptops to. It usually takes 15 turns to finally get them configured correctly. I'm tracking that now and trying to drive this down to three. We're putting in checklists everywhere, especially when we do handoffs within the team. It's really making a difference. Error rates are way down. I smile and say, This is important. Getting executives and workers the tools they need to do their jobs is one of our primary responsibilities. I'm not saying I don't believe you, but let's keep these time estimates to ourselves for now. 
If you can generate a week's track record of hitting the dates, then let's start publishing this to all the requesters and their managers, okay? Patty smiles in return. I was thinking the same thing. Imagine what this will do to user satisfaction if we could tell them when they make the request how long the queue is, tell them to the day when they'll get it, and actually hit the date, because we're not letting our workers multitask or get interrupted. My plant supervisor friend also told me about the improvement kata they've adopted. Believe it or not, Eric helped them institute it many years ago. They have continual two-week improvement cycles, each requiring them to implement one small plan-do-checked-act project to keep them marching toward the goal. You don't mind that I've taken the liberty of adopting this practice in our group to keep us moving toward our own goals, right? Eric had mentioned this kata term and the continual two-week improvement cycles before. Once again, Patty is at least one step ahead of me. This is great work, Patty. Really, really well done. Thanks, she modestly responds, but she's grinning from ear to ear. I'm really excited by what I'm learning. For the first time, I'm seeing how we should be managing our work. And even for these simpler service desk tasks, I know it's going to make a big difference. She points at the change board at the front of the room. What I'm really looking forward to is to start using these techniques for more complex work. Once we figure out what our most frequently recurring tasks are, we need to create more centers and lanes of work, just like I did for my service requests. Maybe we can even get rid of some of this scheduling and create Kanban boards instead. Our engineers could then take any card from the ready column, move them to doing, until they're done. Unfortunately, I can't visualize it. Keep going. Just make sure you're working with Wes on this and that he's on board, okay? Already on it, she replies quickly. In fact, I have a meeting with him later today to discuss putting a Kanban around Brent, to further isolate him from our daily crises. I want to formalize how Brent gets work and increase our ability to standardize what he's working on. It'll give us a way to figure out where all of Brent's work comes from, both on the upstream and downstream sides. And of course, it will give us one more line of defense from people doing drive-bys on Brent. I give her a thumbs up and get ready to leave. Wait, the change board looks different. Why are the cards different colors? She looks at the board and says, Oh, I haven't told you? We're color-coding the cards to help us get ready for when we lift the project freeze. We've got to have some way to make sure we're working on the most important things. So, the purple cards are the changes supporting one of the top five business projects. Otherwise, they're yellow. The green cards are for internal IT improvement projects, and we're experimenting with allocating 20% of our cycles just for those, as Eric recommended we do. At a glance, we can confirm that there's the right balance of purple and green cards in work. She continues, The pink sticky notes indicate the cards that are blocked somehow, which we're therefore reviewing twice a day. We're also putting all these cards back into our change tracking tool, so we're putting the change IDs on each of the cards too. It's a bit tedious, but at least now part of the tracking is automated. Wow, that's... incredible, I say with genuine awe. Later that day, I'm sitting down at another conference table with Wes and Patty to figure out how we're going to turn the project faucet back on slowly enough so we can drink but don't end up drowning. As Eric pointed out, we actually have two project cues that we need to sequence, business and internal projects, Patty says, pointing to the thin, stapled set of papers in front of us. Let's do the business projects first, because they're easier. We have the top five most important projects identified, as ranked by all the project sponsors. Four of those will require some work from Brent. When the freeze lifts, we propose that we only release these five projects. That was easy, Wes laughs. I can't believe how much arguing, posturing, horse trading, and backstabbing went on to get the top five projects identified. It was worse than Chicago politics. He's right. But in the end, we got our prioritized list. Now to the hard part. 
We're still struggling on how to prioritize our own 73 internal projects, she says, her expression turning glum. There's still way too many. We've spent weeks with all the team leads trying to establish some sort of relative importance level, but that's all we've done, argue. She flips to the second page. The projects seem to fall into the following categories. Replacing fragile infrastructure, vendor upgrades, or supporting some internal business requirement. The rest are a hodgepodge of audit and security work, data center upgrade work, and so forth. I look at the second list, scratching my head. Patty is right. How does one objectively decide whether consolidating and upgrading email server is more or less important than upgrading 35 instances of SQL databases? I run my fingers down the page, trying to see if anything jumps out at me. It's the same list I saw during my first week on the job, and they still all look important. Realizing that Wes and Patty have spent almost a week with this list, I try to elevate my thinking. There's got to be some simple way to prioritize this list that doesn't look like moving a bunch of boxes around. Suddenly, I remember how Eric described the importance of preventative work, such as the monitoring project. I say, I don't care how important everyone thinks their project is. We need to know whether it increases our capacity at our constraint, which is still Brent. Unless the project reduces his workload or enables someone else to take it over, maybe we shouldn't even be doing it. On the other hand, if a project doesn't require Brent, there's no reason we shouldn't just do it. I say assertively, Give me three lists. One that requires Brent work, one that increases Brent's throughput, and the last one is everything else. Identify the top projects on each list. Don't spend too much time ordering them. I don't want us spending days arguing. The most important list is the second one. We need to keep Brent's capacity up by reducing the amount of unplanned work that hits him. That sounds familiar, Patty says. She digs up the list of fragile services that we created for the change management process. We should make sure we have a project to replace or stabilize each one of these. And maybe we suspend indefinitely any infrastructure refresh project for anything that's not fragile. Now hang on a minute, Wes says. Bill, you said it yourself. Preventative work is important, but it always gets deferred. We've been trying to do some of these projects for years. This is our chance to get caught up. Patty says quickly, Didn't you hear what Eric told Bill? Improving something anywhere not at the constraint is an illusion. You know, no offense, but you sort of sound like John right now. Despite my best attempts, I still laugh. Wes turns red for a moment, and then laughs loudly. Ouch. Okay, you got me. But I'm just trying to do the right thing. Don't, he says, interrupting himself. I did it again. We all laugh. It makes me wonder how John is doing. To the best of my knowledge, no one has seen him all day. While Wes and Patty are scribbling notes, I scan the list of internal projects again. Hey, why is there a project for upgrading the BART database even though it's going to be decommissioned next year? Patty peers down at her list and then looks embarrassed. Oh, jeez. I didn't see that because we never reconciled the business and IT projects with each other. We're going to have to scrub the lists one more time to find dependencies like this. I'm sure there are others. Patty thinks for a moment. It's strange. Even though we have so much data on projects, changes, and tickets, we've never organized and linked them all together this way before. Here's another thing we can learn from manufacturing, I think, she continues. We're doing what manufacturing production control departments do. They're the people that schedule and oversee all of production to ensure they can meet customer demand. When they accept an order, they confirm there's enough capacity and necessary inputs at each required work center, expediting work when necessary. They work with the sales manager and plant manager to build a production schedule so they can deliver on all their commitments. Again, Patty is way ahead of me. This answers one of the first questions that Eric tasked me with before I quit, 
I make a note for us to visit MRP-8 to see their production control processes. I get a creeping suspicion that managing the IT operations production schedule should be somewhere in my job description. Two days later, I'm surprised to see a new laptop in my office. My old laptop has been disconnected and moved to the side. I look at my clipboard, flipping back to the laptop desktop replacement schedule that Patty gave me earlier this week. Holy crap! Patty had promised laptop delivery for Friday, and I'm receiving it two days early. I log on to make sure it's been configured properly. All the applications seem to be there. All my data have been transferred, email is working, and network drives show up like before, and I can install new applications. I feel tears of gratitude welling up when I see how fast my new laptop is. Grabbing Patty's schedule, I go next door. I love the new laptop, two days ahead of schedule even. Everyone ahead of me got their systems too, right? Patty grins. Yep, every single one of them. A couple of the early ones we delivered had a few configuration errors or were missing something. We've corrected it in the work instructions, and we seem to be batting 100% delivering correct systems for the past two days. Great work, Patty, I say excitedly. Go ahead and start publishing the schedule. I want to start showing this off. Chapter 23 Tuesday, October 7th as I drive into work the following Tuesday morning, I get an urgent phone call from Kirsten. Apparently, Brent is now almost a week late delivering on another Phoenix task, allegedly something that Brent said would only take an hour to do. Once again, the entire Phoenix testing schedule is in jeopardy. On top of that, several other of my group's critical tasks are late, putting even more pressure on the deadline. This is genuinely dispiriting to hear. I thought all our recent breakthroughs would solve these due date performance issues. How can we unfreeze more work if we can't even keep up now? I leave Patty a voicemail. To my surprise, it takes her three hours to call me back. She tells me that something is going terribly wrong with our scheduling estimates and that we need to meet right away. Once again, I'm in a conference room with Patty at the whiteboard and Wes scrutinizing the printouts she's taped up. Here's what I've learned so far, Patty says, pointing at one of the sheets of paper. The task that Kirsten called about is delivering a test environment to QA. As she said, Brent estimated that it would take only 45 minutes. Sounds about right, Wes says. You just need to create a new virtualized server and then install the OS and a couple of packages on it. He probably even doubled the time estimate to be safe. That's what I thought, too, Patty said, but she's shaking her head. Except it's not just one task. What Brent signed up for is more like a small project. There's over 20 steps involving at least six different teams. You need the OS and all the software packages, license keys, dedicated IP address, special user accounts set up, mount points configured... And then you need the IP addresses to be added to an ACL list on some file server. In this particular case, the requirements say that we need a physical server, so we also need a router port, cabling, and a server rack where we have enough space. Oh, Wes says, sounding exasperated, reading what Patty is pointing at. He mumbles, Physical servers are such a pain in the ass. You're missing the point. This would still be happening even if it were virtualized, Patty says. First, Brent's task turns out to be considerably more than just a task. Second, we're finding that it's multiple tasks spanning multiple people, each of whom have their own urgent work to do. We're losing days at each handoff. At this rate, without some dramatic intervention, it'll be weeks before QA gets what they need. At least we don't need a firewall change, Wes says snidely. Last time we needed one of those, it took John's group almost a month. Four weeks for a 30-second change. I nod, knowing exactly what Wes is referring to. The lead time for firewall changes has become legendary. 
Wait, didn't Eric mention something like this? For a firewall change, even though the work only required 30 seconds of touch time, it still took four weeks of clock time. That's just a microcosm of what's happening with Brent. But what's happening to us right now is much, much worse, because there are handoffs. With a groan, I put my head on the conference table. You okay? Patty asks. Give me a second, I say. I walk up to the whiteboard and struggle to draw a graph with one of the markers. After a couple of tries, I end up with a graph labeled Percent Resource Busy along the x-axis and Wait Time along the y-axis. I draw a curve that rises exponentially as Percent Busy crosses the 90% mark. I tell them what Eric told me about MRP8, about how wait times depend upon resource utilization. The wait time is the percentage of time busy divided by the percentage of time idle. In other words, if a resource is 50% busy, then it's 50% idle. The wait time is 50% divided by 50%, so one unit of time. Let's call it one hour. So on average, our task would wait in the queue for one hour before it gets worked. On the other hand, if a resource is 90% busy, the wait time is 90% divided by 10%, or 9 hours. In other words, our task would wait in queue 9 times longer than if the resource were 50% idle. I conclude, So, for the Phoenix task, assuming we have 7 handoffs, and that each of those resources is busy 90% of the time, the tasks would spend in queue a total of 9 hours times the 7 steps. What? 63 hours just in queue time? Wes says incredulously. That's impossible. Patty says with a smirk. Oh, of course. Because it's only 30 seconds of typing, right? Oh, shit, Wes says, staring at the graph. Suddenly, I recall my conversation with Wes right before Sarah and Chris decided to deploy Phoenix at Kirsten's meeting. Wes complained about tickets related to Phoenix bouncing around for weeks, which delayed the deployment. It was happening then, too. That wasn't a handoff between IT operations people. That was a handoff between the development and IT operations organization, which is far more complex. Creating and prioritizing work inside a department is hard. Managing work among departments must be at least ten times more difficult. Patty says, What the graph says is that everyone needs idle time or slack time. If no one has slack time, whip gets stuck in the system, or more specifically, stuck in queues, just waiting. As we digest this, Patty continues, each of those sheets of paper on the board is like this phoenix task, she says, making air quotes with her hands. It looks like a single person task, but it's not. It's actually multiple steps with multiple handoffs among multiple people. No wonder Kirsten's project estimates are off. We need to correct this on Kirsten's schedule and her work breakdown schedule, or WBS. Based on what I've seen, Fully one-third of our commitments to Kirsten fall into this category. Just great, Wes says. It's like Gilligan's Island. We keep sending people off on three-hour tours, and months later, we wonder why none of them come back. Patty says, I wonder if we could create a Kanban lane for each of these tasks. Yes, that's it, I say. Eric was right. You've just found a big pile of recurring work, if we can document and standardize this recurring work and gain some mastery over it, just like you did with laptop replacement, I'm sure we can improve flow. I add, You know, if we can standardize all our recurring deployment work, we'll finally be able to enforce uniformity of our production configurations. That would be our infrastructure snowflake problem. You know, no two alike. How Brent turned into Brent is that we allowed him to build infrastructure only he can understand. We can't let that happen again. Good point, Wes grunts. You know, it's odd. 
So many of these problems we've been facing are caused by decisions we made. We have met the enemy, and he is us. Patty says, You know, deployments are like final assembly in a manufacturing plant. Every flow of work goes through it, and you can't ship the product without it. Suddenly, I know exactly what the Kanban should look like. Over the next 45 minutes, we create our plan. Patty is going to work with Wes's team to assemble the top 20 most frequently recurring tasks. She will also figure out how to better manage and control tasks when they are queued. Patty proposes a new role, a combination of a project manager and expediter. Instead of day-by-day -day oversight, they would provide minute-by-minute -minute control. She says, We need fast and effective handoffs of any completed work to the next work center. If necessary, this person will wait at the work center until the work is completed and carry to the next work center. We'll never let critical work get lost in a pile of tickets again. What? Someone assigned to carry around tasks from person to person, like a waiter? Wes asks in disbelief. At MRP-8, they have a water spider role that does exactly that, she counters. Almost all of this latest Phoenix delay was due to tasks waiting in queues or handoffs. This will make sure it doesn't happen again. Eventually, she adds, I'll want to move all the Kanbans so that we don't need a person acting as the signaling mechanism for work handoffs. Don't worry. I'll have it figured out in a couple of days. Wes and I don't dare doubt her.